One Piece chapter 995 is one of the more explosive chapters we've had in a while, but not only explosive, there's so much to talk about and dissect. It's honestly really exciting. Um, we have chapters from time to time that you feel like not much happened and the discussion topics really aren't there, but for this chapter, there are a slew of them. But enough delay, let's dissect as best we can One Piece chapter 995. So yeah, no cover story this week, just a cover page request, and I know I have been very hard on the Oh My Family cover story. And let me just say, it wasn't bad, it just was very long. There were questionable moments, but it just dragged for too long. I do prefer cover stories as opposed to cover page requests, mainly because the cover stories are canon, and I am holding out hope that at some point, they're all animated, but I gotta say, the cover page requests, they can be fun, and this time, they feature Luffy attempting to study, but we know how that would turn out, as well as the Risky Brothers. Well, I guess not exactly because they were derived from the Risky Brothers from the Rolling Pirates of your Shadows, but it is a cool way to tie in Thriller Bark, which has had multiple references this arc, and all the more reason Moria, at some point, in my opinion, definitely makes an appearance. But enough of this pretty interesting cover story, let's get to the chapter. The chapter started out with a bang, literally, and that was between Big Mom and Marco. This was somewhat surprising, but again, not really based off of Marco's demeanor when we last saw him with Big Mom and Pedro Spero. And it seems after Big Mom revealed her intentions, he was still ready to engage at a moment's notice. I remember I mentioned that when it happened and people were saying, no way, Marco knows better, etc. And yeah, Marco does not care whatsoever. He clashed with the big woman. A few things though, like I mentioned, Oda is deepening the Yonko lore and their relationships by giving us tidbits of information, which isn't meant to be the focus of the dialogue, but it's almost like an aside to the audience like hey by the way this happened and what i'm referring to in this case is marco mentioning just how much more than the current alliance he knows about big mom and this to me indicates or hints that at some point the white bit pirates engage with the big mom pirates and big mom has done a lot more than we the readers currently know this is echoed by pedos Pedro explicitly stating that he wanted to kill marco in the past on multiple occasions i mean i absolutely love this not only because it fits my initial thoughts about the yonko and their engagement but it just makes sense i mean what we've seen so far from big mom tells us that she is right and at a moment's notice, she does not have a problem engaging with anyone. Big Mom herself gave Kaido some hype in Whole Cake Island. Then when she felt like it, she went to his turf and fought him. So Big Mom engaging with Whitebeard at some point makes sense based on her words about him. Big Mom did state that if she gained the allegiance of the Elbaf army, she would be able to become the Pirate King and defeat even Whitebeard, which using simple deductive reasoning, places Whitebeard on a different plateau from the other Yonko. And it makes it clear that she could not overcome him in her current state at the time of the engagement. I mean, tidbits like this may not matter to some, but to me, it does because at times, I think way too much and it makes the world feel alive and vibrant and I love it. The most important part from this scene based on just how many people are talking about it though, is Marco's special ability. And I'm working on some research in regards to this topic, so it will be covered this week, I know. I know, but I'll just say this. I don't think this is a retcon. I think this has always been the case for Marco. Oda was just waiting for the perfect time to introduce this. And I've seen the Marine Ford criticism saying whatever special ability he had, he should have used it there because people were dying. It's fair. I suppose, but we've already seen other indications of top tiers not necessarily giving it their all in Whitebeard, Kainu, and even Aokiji based on output we've seen from them on separate occasions. Seen is a bit of a stretch because we didn't see it, we just saw the aftermath, but you know, you catch my drift. And the reasons vary among these characters, but again, you catch my drift. Nonetheless, this ability is fascinating because I'm starting to wonder just how much more Oda is going to delve into. All right, you know what? I'll save that for the video, but just know that Marco could be absolutely broken. I did also see comments about how the hell could Pedospedo hurt Marco when he used candy, which seems to be susceptible to flame. Well, I don't think it would have worked, but it seems like he had used hockey on his candy. I'm not sure if we've seen that before. If so, please remind me. Something that genuinely made me laugh out loud, other than Wanda and Carrot showing up and taking out Pedospedo's eyes for their friend who destroyed himself, is Big Mom straight up leaving her eldest son with three enemies, one of which she admitted that she couldn't defeat at the moment. Like, Big Mom does not care about these kids at all. Like, she really doesn't. But Carrot and Wanda do look amazing though in too long form and i'm pretty excited to see more of their abilities versus pedospero in the anime because no way in hell oda shows this and i'm partially saying this based on how oda has been in the past with the manga and the anime and partially because i'm hoping i'm wrong and oda shows us a significant amount either way i think it's a win-win either i called it or oda shows it you know <laughs> but to finish this up the screams that marco heard are definitely the screams of individuals turning into ice demons from queen's experiments so he's definitely joining that group but before that we have some zoro action apu is on the run from the group and as expected zoro and x drake get to him first and apu shows us that 
that he is not a one trick pony. I was mildly surprised that he was able to fend off what a lot of people consider to be two top five, top six supernova. And I think the disparity is so little that ranking them is irrelevant, but we're still gonna do it because it's, it's fun. Something cool that I noticed though, is Apu is using Tanfa. Those are Chinese melee weapons, which I think is perfect for him because he's a long arm and maintaining distance and he can also maximize his combat potential. Um, but the fact that he's using a Chinese weapon makes sense because his attire always reminded me of traditional Chinese clothing. And I love, I absolutely love when Oda just ties things together for us to, to get the hint. Something that's also been a theme is Zoro stating over and over and over that he wants to go through the roof, which is definitely either going to happen or we will have a curveball, which to me is unlikely. I think this is also an interesting way in which Oda can justify Zoro not going all out until he gets to face off against either Kaido or the speculative king. And for some people out there, you know, holding out hope that he faces uh, Kuina. Anyway, the X Drake and Apu hating each other line is great to me because I hate forced kumbaya moments and I do not foresee that between these two, especially with Diaz being a fed. But a very contentious moment for the community, but not contentious for normal people, is Queen talking about the fighters of the Alliance and somewhat ranking Zoro and Sanji. And people, this does not matter in the grand scheme of things, but for agendas, boy is it lovely. I'm seeing literal 100 message threads of Zoro and Sanji fans going back and forth about the order. I'm seeing edits to make it more likely that Zoro is stronger. It is all hilarious and reminds me why our community is definitely one of a kind. The most important part of this dialogue though is Queen and his possible affiliation with Judge and Vegapunk, which I talked about a couple weeks back, based on how impressive Queen's inventions were. Also, Orochi mentioning Vegapunk does not just come out of nowhere and more than likely Queen requested him as someone who could, you know, take their crew to the next level. And no, I will not be addressing the Kizaru is Vegapunk theory, that one person that says that every time Vegapunk is mentioned. Please, please stop. But folks, Burke may be immortal and invincible, but Chopper is not. I do not think this is a power up. I've been seeing some comments about that and him not noticing is not a problem. Reason being, Chopper is used to the cold. And so in the midst of fighting and adrenaline, yeah, he's not gonna notice a you know, slight cold spell. It also seems like due to Brooke, he's figured something out, which to point out the obvious shows just how critical Chopper is to the Straw Hats. Um, but someone made an interesting comment, but I lost it, so I'm sorry and I love you. But they mentioned Queen possibly using Lineage Factor to create these plague bullets and may even be using the number as experiments to create them. And maybe even Kaido. If this is the case, what if Chopper uses his DNA as a source to possibly slow down the transformations? And I think Chopper's reaction to his arm was based on what he saw, but not necessarily what he felt. So meaning he wasn't really in pain based off of just how his body is. Very interesting when you think about it, but Marco is also right there with his special flame ability. So that's also another option. The final and most discussed part of the chapter is Nami and Usopp versus Page One and Ulti. I'll begin here. I had a slight critique about if we saw everything that led up to Nami's declaration of Luffy becoming the Pirate King, it may have been a bit more emotional, but that's not a definitive fact, but that's how it is for me. I know others who were emotional based on how it was portrayed in a chapter. I mean, it's all about preference, but in no way is it bad. Just wanted to get that out of the way because I saw some people being critical of how I felt about the chapter, right? But I just got to say these final panels were beautiful for several reasons and Oda has been setting this all up. This isn't Alabasta or Along Park, so I understand why we can get all of that build up to get here. But as reminded to me by my guys Breezy and Janoy and even some people in the comment section, Oda had things in motion to make this moment somewhat monumental. In Skypiea, when they knew they were facing an L, Nami started panicking and contemplated they were losing, being taken away, and Luffy had to remind her that she's a member of the future King of the Pirates crew. When Frankie ran over Big Mom, Nami talked about running away because she's an emperor and had to be reminded by Frankie that just because she's an emperor, it does not matter. In a Bisu, they were discussing if Nami was to be tortured. She said she would lie and how long she would last before she squealed. She said three seconds. All this to show that in the face of death, Nami still did not deny Luffy will become the king of the pirates. This is also going back to the Straw Hat gags. When they're absolutely needed, they will always come through. What I absolutely loved about this moment though is that this felt like it's no longer a mantra or a fleeting thought. The fact that Luffy will become the Pirate King. This is real and such a solidified fact believed by the entire crew that Nami, if she denied Luffy would become Pirate King, would probably feel like she was lying. Also, who would Nami be if she denied Luffy even in the face of death when Bellamere did not deny her when she was faced with a similar decision? There was no way in hell she was denying Luffy. Yes, the buildup was not as straightforward, but when you revisit these moments, you quickly realize why this is so significant. Nami is freaking amazing, man. I've seen a lot of people also upset at Usopp for telling her to lie, but Jesus Christ, that's Usopp, logical and sometimes a scaredy cat. But Usopp is legitimately a powerhouse. Seriously, Usopp has consistently taken loads of damage and just doesn't die, or sometimes not even unconscious. He wasn't unconscious here. He's a beast himself, honestly. He should probably join the monster trio, replace Jimbei or something. I'm joking for people that 
Couldn't tell. Finally, Nami is saved by Tama, legitimately one of my favorite characters in Wano, and some were upset that she's here, stating, this is no place for a child. LOL. And I'm pretty sure they're the same people who feel like Momonosuke shouldn't join the Straw Hats because he's a kid too. People. In the One Piece world, being a kid doesn't automatically absolve you from torture or even hardship. It honestly makes you more susceptible to it. So like Dofi, Law, Luffy, Robin, Sabo, Ace, and many more, if you can fight back and help out even a little bit, I think it's imperative that you do. So there's that. But yeah, guys, that's about it. Those are my thoughts, my deep thoughts on the chapter. Please give me your thoughts as I have shared mine. And now you must share yours. That is indeed equivalent exchange. And thank you so much for your support. But I would like for you to like this video and subscribe if you enjoyed this. Again, we'll be talking about Marco this week and we might even have an early chapter. So stay tuned for that. Follow me on Twitter at BragoDAce. Follow me on Instagram at BragoD.Ace. Thank you to my patrons. I appreciate all you guys so much. Again, guys, like and subscribe. The like button is pretty free and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.